Good evening. I want to thank all of you uh, deeply for joining us tonight. And I'm so honored to welcome Israeli President Reuven Rivlin. What a special honor for the residents. Thank you for being here. Deeply appreciate it. Thank you. You've distinguished yourself as a public servant, a voice of principle, a defender of democracy, a champion of equity and inclusion, and a true patriot. And UCLA is truly honored to have you here tonight. We're also honored to have the numerous connections and relationships with Israeli institutions. Many of UCLA's departments and professional schools have students and faculty exchange programs, including the School of Law, the David Geffen School of Medicine, the Anderson School of Management, and the Semioli School of Engineering and Applied Science. So there are relationships with Israeli institutions across our institution, lots of connectivity. Our students participate in study programs at Hebrew University, Ben-Gurion University of the Negev, and Technion, and others I suspect as well, but those are the ones I'm aware of. Israeli thinkers, leaders, artists, and entrepreneurs regularly visit this campus and share their ideas. So we have a close relationship and uh, we welcome more exchanges. These exchanges are very meaningful to UCLA community and we're proud of all of them. We're especially proud of the Nazarian Center, which is a vital presence on our campus, helping us really understand the depth and complexity of Israel's history, its society, and its culture. So the Nazarian Center has been sort of foundational here in us better understanding and connecting with Israel. UCLA strives to provide insight on topics that are often dominated by stereotypes. The leadership of our distinguished Nazarian Center, Director Dove Waxman, will help us do even more in the years ahead. And we're wonderful, we're very lucky to have Dove with us as our new, our new director. So I look forward to our relationships growing stronger, working together to create a climate of understanding, progress, justice, and peace for all. Now please let me welcome Professor and Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair in Israeli Studies and Nazarian Center Director Director Dove Waxman. Thank you, Chancellor Block, for your kind words and for hosting this very special event, especially at such short notice. There are many other people that I would like to thank, but since I don't have much time, I would just like to say as the director of the Eunice and Soraya Nazarian Center for Israel Studies, how grateful we are to the President's Office in Jerusalem, to the Israeli Consulate here in Los Angeles, and especially to Hillel Newman, the Consul General, to the Chancellor's Office at UCLA and the Special Events Team, to Sharon Nazarian, the Chair of the Nazarian Center's Community Advisory Board, and to Ehud Peleg, one of our board members, all of whom have been instrumental in making this important event possible. And I'd also like to thank the dedicated staff of the Nazarian Center for all their hard work in putting this event together in such short notice, just two weeks. I started working at UCLA just six weeks ago. Very excited to be directing the Nazarian Center. Thank you. Thank you. In my wildest dreams, I never imagined that I would have the great privilege to be introducing His Excellency, the President of the State of Israel, Reuven Rivlin, and giving him UCLA's Israel Studies Award. It is a real honor for me personally and for the Nazarian Center. Before I tell you why President Rivlin is such a deserving recipient of this award, let me tell you just a bit about the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. It was established in 2010 as the first full-fledged Israel Studies Center on the West Coast with an endowment gift from the Nazarian Family Foundation. The primary mission of the center is to promote and support the study of modern Israel at UCLA and beyond. To that end, we sponsor courses for UCLA students, provide funding to support research in the academic field of Israel studies, host postdoctoral fellows, and bring professors from Israel to teach at UCLA. The center's other mission is to engage and educate the public about Israel in order to promote a broader, deeper, more nuanced, and more multifaceted understanding of modern Israel. We do this through our many public programs. We want to be a place where people of all ages and backgrounds can learn about Israel's history, politics, society, and culture, and where serious civil discussions and thoughtful dialogue about Israel can take place. If they're not happening at a university like ours, where else can they happen? Given our commitment to civil discourse and dialogue, 
It is particularly fitting that President Rivlin is the recipient of our Israel Studies Award, which was created to recognize individuals of extraordinary character and merit in their chosen fields, whether in academia, public service, business, or the arts, who have contributed to a greater understanding of Israel or made outstanding contributions to Israeli society and culture. No one is more deserving of this prestigious award than he is. His long and distinguished service to the State of Israel and to Israeli society has been truly extraordinary. Reuven Rivlin, or Ruvi, as he is nicknamed, was born in 1939 in Jerusalem, where six generations of his family had lived before him, after his ancestors arrived from Eastern Europe in 1809. His father was an Arabic scholar who translated the Quran into Hebrew, which possibly helps explain why President Rivlin has long been a leading advocate of Arab-Jewish coexistence, and why during his presidency, he has made outreach to Arab citizens of Israel, both Muslim and Christian, a cornerstone of his time in office, and why he speaks out so passionately against anti-Arab racism and discrimination in Israel. He genuinely believes that Israel is not just a state for Jews, but also for its Arab citizens, who make up 20% of its population. As a young man, President Rivlin served as an intelligence officer in the IDF and fought in the Six-Day War. Following his military service, he studied law at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and then he was elected to Israel's parliament for the first time in 1988, serving seven terms. He was also chairman of the Likud party during this time. From 2001 to 2003, he was minister of communications in the government of Ariel Sharon, and then he was elected speaker of the Knesset, serving first from 2003 to 2006, and for a second time from 2009 to 2013. In this role, President Rivlin resolutely protected the Knesset's independence from the government and gained wide recognition for his defense of Israeli democracy and for his efforts to safeguard the rights of Israel's minorities. In June 2014, he was elected the 10th president of the State of Israel, succeeding the late Shimon Peres. Following in the footsteps of Shimon Peres, a Nobel Peace Prize winner is no easy task. But like his widely esteemed predecessor, President Rivlin has elevated the presidency, which is mainly a ceremonial and symbolic role, elevated it to much greater prominence and importance. He has made the task of society building the central focus of his presidency. The task of state building is complete. Israel is now a strong, successful state. President Rivlin recognizes that building a cohesive and inclusive Israeli society is now the country's greatest and most urgent challenge. In his famous Four Tribes speech, given at the Herzliya Conference on the 7th of June 2015, President Rivlin delivered what he called a wake-up call to Israeli society. This short video from the office of the president clearly conveys the message he expressed that day. Israeli society is changing, and these are no small changes either. These changes will redefine us as Israelis and have a significant impact on the way we understand ourselves and our national home. A new reality for Israeli society isn't some bleak prophecy of the future. It's a reality taking shape before our very eyes. Look at your typical first grade class in the Israeli school system. In the 90s, Israeli society was made up of a clear majority with minorities living alongside it. There was a large secular Zionist majority living side by side with three minorities, national religious, Arab, and ultra-Orthodox minorities. Today's first grade class consists of 38% secular students, 15% national religious, 25% Arabs, and almost 25% ultra-Orthodox students. The demographic processes reshaping Israeli society have effectively created a new reality for Israeli society, with no clear majority and no clear minorities either. In this new reality, Israeli society is made up of four sectors, or if you will, four main tribes, each different from the others, but of about the same size. This sharp division in Israeli society manifests first and foremost in four different and distinct educational systems. Boys from Beit El or Rahat, 
girls from Herzliya or Beitar elite, not only won't ever meet, they're taught very different attitudes towards Israel's fundamental values and the character it aspires to. Will this be a secular, liberal state? A democratic Jewish state? A state based on religious law? A religious democratic state? A state of all its citizens or nationalities? Tribe, 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 tribe. Similarly, each tribe has its own media bonfire. The newspapers it reads, the TV channels it watches. Furthermore, each tribe has its own towns. Tel Aviv, Om Fahm, Efrat, and B'nai Brak. This new reality for Israeli society has far-reaching implications on Israel's resilience and the future of us all. In order to instill hope, we must first know the fact. Suppressing or fighting them will not help. All of us, ultra-Orthodox, secular, religious, and Arab, are here. We are here to stay. So we must learn how to do that together. If we cherish life, if the vision of a democratic Jewish state is our dream and aspiration, today we are called on to face that reality head on out of a deep commitment to find answers together. Out of a willingness among all the tribes of Israel to put together a common Israeli vision of hope. The new Israeli order of today calls on us to move away from the accepted dichotomy of minority-majority to a new approach of partnership between Israel's different sectors. This partnership must be based on four firm foundations. The first is a sense of confidence among each sector that participating in this partnership does not require it to forego the fundamentals of its identity. Ultra-Orthodox or secular, religious or Arab, none must feel that what they hold most dear is at risk or under any threat. The second foundation is shared responsibility. When no tribe is a minority, no side can escape responsibility for the destiny and future of Israel and its society. The third foundation is fairness and equality. To protect this partnership, we must ensure that no citizen faces discrimination or favoritism based on the sector to which he belongs. Yes, and the fourth and most challenging foundation of all is creating a common Israeli identity. The emerging Israeli mosaic is not forced upon us. It is a tremendous opportunity, an opportunity replete with a rich cultural legacy, inspiration, humanity, and sensitivity. If we believe that we weren't forced, but destined to live together, we can rise to this challenge. We must understand what educating for partnership means given that there are different educational systems. How we can run an economy and public sector that excels in diverse employment opportunities. What media is like when it serves as a shared platform. Higher education that does not compromise on quality, but can still create a receptive cultural environment. Politics and political dialogue that take into consideration the sensitivities and foundations of such a partnership. Establishing this partnership is an enormous task. I stand before you convinced that Israeli society now needs a wake-up call. I call on all of you to rise to the challenge with me. Only thus, together and as partners, can we renew Israeli hope. President Rivlin has provided, as you can see, the metaphor, the vision, and the voice that was sorely needed to move the issue of inclusive society building from the sidelines to center stage. He has worked tirelessly to strengthen the unity of Israeli society while giving respect to every distinct group within it. He has celebrated the mosaic of Israeli society and championed the values of coexistence, tolerance, equality, and civility. And he has done so because of his firm commitment to ensuring Israel's future as a Jewish and democratic state. In a period when Israeli society often seems deeply, even dangerously fractured, when Israeli politics is deadlocked and Israeli democracy itself is under stress, President Rivlin has been the leading voice in Israel 
calling for shared citizenship, social inclusion, civil discourse, and respect for democratic norms. His courageous leadership, his integrity, and honesty have earned him the respect of Israelis of all backgrounds, Jews and Arabs, religious and secular, and from across the political spectrum, despite the fact that President Rivlin himself is on the right. He has become a unifying figure, a moral compass, and a guardian of Israeli democracy, standing firmly by his beliefs, whether or not they're popular or politically expedient. He is, in short, an exemplary leader, a true Democrat, and a great statesman for Israel. At a time when this kind of leadership is in desperately short supply around the world, when politics in many countries has descended into populism, when political discourse has frequently degenerated into ad hominem attacks and angry polemics, and when liberal democracy itself and even civility seems increasingly threatened, there could not be a better time for us to honor President Rivlin by awarding him UCLA's Israel Studies Award. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency President Rivlin onto the stage, <laughs> along with Chancellor Block, Soraya Nazarian, the founder, one of the founders of our center, along with her husband Eunice, and the sculpture of this beautiful award, and her daughter, Sharon Nazarian. UCLA Chancellor Jane Block, Dr. Hillel Newman, Council General of Israel, Professor Dov Waxman, Soraya and Sharon Nazrian, distinguished guests. Before appreciating the very idea of getting this award, I would like to tell you that I came to, he to you here in Los Angeles, not only as the President of Israel, but also as a Jerusalemite, as a member of the Rivlin family. I'm here along with my daughter. My daughter is eighth generation born in Jerusalem. And her daughters, <laughs> and her daughters are ninth generation born in Jerusalem. We came to Jerusalem in the year 1809, not because it was the year 1809. We came all the way from Vilna, not because we have suffered in Vilna. Vilna was defined at the time as Jerusalem of the North. And uh, we were living there, and Judaism was in pro prosperity, and uh, the uh, head of the family and our rabbi, the Vilna Gaon, the genius of Vilna, have said to us, why should we pray the Rivlin family three times a day to God to return us back to Jerusalem? Let's go to Jerusalem. <laughs> no one is stopping us. And why we should go in 1809? Because in 1809, according to the Jewish calendar, it would be the year tough Kuf Ein, three letters that make sense in one word in Hebrew, Tka. Tka is sound, and sound is sound, the great shofar, the great horn to proclaim freedom. Let's go to Jerusalem. 250 members of our family and pupils of the Vilna Gaon came to Jerusalem and they were welcomed by all the Jerusalemites, most of them Muslims some of them Christians, some of them Armenians, uh, and everyone have received us in really open hands and open heart because they thought that if people will get to Jerusalem, maybe the redemption of Jerusalem will get uh, uh, to, to be fulfilled. And uh, we are there since then. Unfortunately, we had uh, some ups and downs uh, with our Jerusalemite cousins and Jerusalemite friend. We all together are living there. We are not doomed to live there together. 
It's our destiny to live uh, together, as I've said before, and we are trying. We are trying to convince them that it's not too bad to live along with us in uh, the city of Jerusalem, which is a microcosm of all the conflict that became a tragedy between us and our cousins and the, uh, our friends uh, in uh, Jerusalem from the Muslim side or from the Christian side. I'm also here as a very good friend, although one of them was my tutor, my professor at the university, but I served him, with him in the army as well, Professor Aaron Barak, that I'm very proud to have the same opportunity to get the award. Uh, it is a great honor. Aaron Barak is a great man. <laughs> and, more, and more than that, a year ago, my dear friend, Amos Oz have passed away, and he was one of the greatest authors of Israel in our time. God bless his soul. And he was also one of the people who have got this award, and I'm so proud to be now a member in the same, in the same uh, group, uh, which is a real great honor to all of you. My dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, as we say in Hebrew, Morotai verabotai. The story of Yunus and Suraya Nazrian and the Iranian Jewish community is inspiring. In only a few decades, this community has made tremendous contribution to the city of Los Angeles, to the American Jewish community, and, of course, to Israel. The Nazrian family is a model of commitment to the Jewish people and to the state of Israel. And I'm honored, I'm honored, as I've said before, to receive this award on the cent of the uh, center uh, 10th year anniversary here at the UCLA, the University of California. So let me say to you, thank you. And as we say in Hebrew, toda raba. This center is an expression of the deep belief that education is the key of promoting change. This is a belief that I share with all my heart. It is at the heart of my, of my efforts to address one of Israel's greatest challenges today. Israel is a success story, yes, we can say a miracle. In 72 years, almost 73 years now, we have gone from a developing country to a world leader in innovation. But if we want to preserve this miracle, we must keep Israeli society united. There is no other way. We have to keep the whole Jewish people in, united. And because of that, I've had it already here in Los Angeles three years ago. We are living in Israel four tribes, but we have a fifth tribe. And the fifth tribe are the people in the diaspora. All our Jewish brothers and sisters, we are all one family. <laughs> we have responsibility one for each other. So, as I've said, we must keep Israeli society united and the Jewish society united. We must close the gap between those sectors of Israeli society that are part of the Israeli success story and those that got left behind. Especially, as it was mentioned, Israel's Haredim and Arab sectors. As the four main sectors of Israeli society become closer in size, we must build 
a new partnership based on trust, respect, economic integration, and mobility. That is why I launched the Israeli OPA initiative, which focuses on four core elements of society. Basic education, higher education and employment, the public sector, and the local government. In the last decade, we made big progress in raising awareness and opening the gates of Israeli society. Now, it is time to create together a, share, a shared story of experience of what it is to be an Israeli. We still have a long road ahead of us, but I am truly convinced that we will succeed. Actually, we cannot will succeed. We must succeed. There is no other way. This is the key to the prosperity and success of the State of Israel as a state that both Jewish and democratic, democratic and Jewish at the same time. Israel is not democracy only to the Jewish people. Israel is democracy to all its citizens and all the people who are living along with us in Israel. Thanks God, when I was born 80 years ago, there were at about 250,000 Jews in, Jerus in, in Israel. Most of them were in Jerusalem, uh, 60,000 of them. Uh, now, out of nine million citizens in Israel, we are seven million Jews and we are all family. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, just as we work to strengthen the unity of Israeli society, we must work to ensure the unity of the Jewish people. We are one nation, one family. We have cousins, we have first cousins, second cousins, we have brothers, we have sisters, but we are one family. We are all responsible one for each other. As we say, Israel arevim zelaze. We must deepen our ties and sense of shared dignity. And of course, destiny. We in Israel are deeply concerned by the rise of anti-Semitic attacks against the fifth tribe, you, the Jewish communities in the diaspora. For you, rise, raising of anti-Semitism is not a theoretical, theoretical issue. It is a real, real threat. From the attack on the Netzach synagogue, to the terrible shooting in Perway, last month, I must say to all of you, we have hosted, people are saying that I have hosted, but we in Israel have hosted almost 50 world leaders in Jerusalem. Kings, presidents, prime ministers, head of states, and the uh, um, speakers and presidents of many parliaments. They each expressed their commitment to fighting anti-Jewish hate. I believe they understand that anti-Semitism is not just a Jewish problem. Anti-Semitism, racism, hatred, and fascism are a problem for all society that value tolerance and democracy. Fighting anti-Semitism does not mean sil silencing debate about Israel. However, on many campuses, those promoting academic boycotts seek not to encourage debate, but to shut it down. 
Along with the challenge of academic boycotts, we are now facing the challenge of the United Nations blacklist, which encourage economic boycotts on many, many uh, uh, factories and uh, companies in Israel. We thank, we thank from the bottom of our heart, the United States of America for standing with us against the shameful political decision. Boycott. Boycotts do not advance peace. Israeli and Palestinians, as I've said before, and I would like to repeat it, the Israelis and Palestinians are not doomed to live together. It is our destiny, and we can do it by creating confidence between the two people. They have to have confidence with us, and we have to have confidence with them. We have to believe them, and they have to believe us. They have to understand that we are not imperialists, that we have returned to our homeland, to our fatherland, after 2,000 years of praying to return back to Jerusalem every day and day. It means that Jerusalem is not a matter that we have decided to get to Jerusalem because the Arab people were living there. We came to Jerusalem because it was the place of our shrine, it, because it was the heart of the Jewish people. It was the heart of Judaism. We came back to our land and we have place for all of us. We have to understand that they, are, they were born there and they have the right also to express themselves in the place that they were born and uh, we can do it. We can do it by creating confidence, by doing everything to understand that although we had some difficulties at the time, to understand that we have to live together, we can live together and it is to our great interests of both sides to live together. As an, as, a, as we say, we must build trust between us and common future based on cooperation that is a win-win for both of us. We are deeply grateful for the bipartisan support for Israel's security, prosperity, and the U.S.-Israeli allies. Maintaining bypass, bipartisan support is critical, critical to Israel's, to Israel's national security. The U.S.-Israel alliance is based on our deepest shared values and on our critical shared interests. This partnership has always been above party politics and do, and so it must remain. And I'm praying for that, that it will remain. I am in very good relationship with both, with the, Republican, with the Republicans and with the Democrats. Uh, and when you have defined me as a rightist or from the right side, I'm, of course, from the right side against the wrong side. <laughs> Friends, thank you again. Thank you again for this honor. And thank you f for all that you are. As we say, toda rabba. So, God bless. God bless the United States of America. God bless Israel. God bless all of you. Thank you so very much. I would just like to thank you, you again, Your Excellency, President Rivlin, uh, for your words, for your wisdom, for sharing your vision for Israeli society with us and your hope for Israel, as well as your hope for the possibility for peace, which I know we all pray for and, and wish for. Um, knowing as you that you're, the, you're leading 
Israel and st as a statesman is a great comfort to us and I know we're really, really thankful for your presence here today. On behalf of the Nazarian Center and UCLA, we deeply appreciate you sharing your wisdom and your precious time with us. Thank you. We wish you a safe onward journey and much success in your work, especially in the months ahead. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today on this very special occasion. I want to thank you all for your patience and understanding regarding the security procedures that we had to follow. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. We will remember this day for a long time to come. Thank you all, and please stand and join me in honoring President Rivlin as he departs. Thank you.